Hi, thanks for being with us on Astro Awani. You are now watching Tamu Awani with me, your host, Said Fadi Omar. Now, today I am joined by Professor Howard Robert Hovitz. Professor Hovitz is the winner of the 2002 Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine uh, through his studies on genetics control of uh, nematode development and behavior. And of course, Professor Hovitz is here um, as a keynote speaker for the Bridges Dialogues Towards a Culture of Peace program, a program initiated and facilitated by the International Peace Foundation. Now, the foundation has been bringing in a Nobel laureate or two to speak uh, to Malaysians uh, or to the people in general uh, between the months of uh, November last year till April this year. So we've had plenty of opportunity to speak to Nobel laureates. And Professor Hovitz is the flavor for March. Now, is it all right if I call you Bob? Absolutely. And thank you very much for being with us, Bob. Well, thank you for inviting me. No, it's, it's our pleasure entirely. Now, let me just read a short um, abstract for your research. How do genes control animal development and behavior? I believe you wrote this yourself. Um, to answer this question, we have isolated developmental and behavioral mutants of the round world, uh, roundworm, uh, Canherbditis elegans, and have used genetic, biochemical, molecular, cellular, and electrophysical uh, techniques to characterize these mutants. Now, Bob, as far as I'm concerned, that could have just been rocket science. It meant absolutely nothing to me um, because I'm not familiar with uh, the field of study that you've done, and I'm sure lots of people out there don't quite understand um, what I've just read as well. So perhaps we could begin with just putting it in the simplest and layman's term. What is your study all about, actually? Well, let me focus on one particular area of our, of our work and the area that was most notably recognized by the Nobel Prize. Mm -hmm. and, and the way I would describe that, and, and this is not rocket science, it's actually very simple once you learn the vocabulary. Okay. Um, the way I would describe that is that we were awarded, and I, I share this prize with two of my colleagues, Sidney mm -hmm. Brenner, who was originally a South African and then lived in Britain for many years, and John Selston, who is from Britain. Mm -hmm. uh, we were awarded this prize basically for studies of the genetic control of programmed cell death. Mm -hmm. Now that may be no clearer than all of the words you said Perhaps before. Slightly. <laughs> so let me let me expand. So what does it mean? What what do we mean by genetic control? And we can go back to the to the basics. Genes. Mm -hmm. Genes are what make us who we, are, who we are. First off, genes are responsible for heredity. So when we have children. Our children inherit our genes, half from one parent, half from the other. Yeah. Our genes is what make us similar to our parents, mm -hmm. more similar to relatives than to other people, more similar to other human beings than to trees or whales <laughs> or orangutans. And, okay, okay, that much we all know. So all right. genes are basically carried in our DNA and it's the DNA that is passed from generation to generation. So what we have done is to figure out what genes control the process of programmed cell death, I'll come back to that in a moment, and how the genes work to do that. So what's programmed cell death? Okay, now if you think about an animal, think about a human being, we all begin as a fertilized egg. Mm -hmm. Sperm and egg come together, and that's one cell. That cell divides to make two cells, and they divide to make four, and then eight, and so on and so forth, until we have many, many cells. And then those cells start to do different things. Some of them become skin cells. Mm -hmm. Some become muscle cells or brain cells, nerve cells. Okay? So that's the basic process of what we call animal development, developmental yeah. biology. Yes, okay. okay. Now it turns out, and this was not something that was obvious, that while this process of development is ongoing and many cells are generated, more cells are made than we end up with in our bodies, mm -hmm. okay? Um, and the extra cells die, okay? And they die essentially by committing suicide. Mm -hmm. they, they have a little program inside them that say, kill myself. Okay, and okay. this is what you mean by timed cell death. And that is, 
programmed cell death, programmed cell death. because the cell death occurs as a part of the normal genetic program for okay. development. Mm -hmm. okay. yep. Um, in our immune systems today, as we're sitting here and talking, in our blood, there are cells being generated, and as many as 95% of the cells that are made are killing themselves. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, this seems as puzzling as you look. Right? Why in the world do we make cells that kill themselves? It seems very wasteful. And for example, our immune systems offer a very simple reason for that. Our immune systems are here to protect ourselves mm -hmm. against foreign invasions, invasion, yep. okay. Okay. viruses, bacteria. Um, but they don't know what's going to attack our bodies. Mm -hmm. So they generate a vast repertoire of molecules that are capable of attacking these invaders. Mm -hmm. And in the course of doing that, they generate cells that are capable of attacking ourselves. Yes, okay. okay. Um, we want to get rid of those cells. So any of the cells that turn out to be dangerous, the body has ways of recognizing mm -hmm. them as dangerous to ourselves mm -hmm. and makes those cells kill themselves. Yep. Okay. Um, if that fails, and any bit of our biology, if it goes wrong, if it fails, leads to disease. Yep. So autoimmune disease okay, is a disease in which our cells end up attacking our bodies. Mm -hmm. That autoimmune disease means that there is an absence of programmed cell death that should occur. Mm -hmm. So programmed cell death is very important in our development. And if the control of programmed cell death goes bad, mm -hmm. we have disease. If there's too much programmed cell death, we can have a degenerative disease. Yep like Alzheimer's or Parkinson's mm -hmm. or Huntington's, brain cells die. When we have a heart attack, heart cells die. And it turns out the heart cells are dying in large part because they're committing suicide. Um, if you fall off a motorcycle on your head, okay, not surprisingly, brain cells will die. Will it's die, not yeah. good for you. <laughs> What is That's surprising? That's rocket science, then, but yeah. <laughs> yep. But what's surprising is that many of those cells die not because they've been squashed, but because, but because they set off a program in which cells commit suicide. Yes. Okay. So there's a growing series of cells that kill themselves. Right. Okay. Many, many diseases, disorders. It turns out cells die. That's bad for us. And it's because the process of programmed cell mm -hmm. death either occurs when it shouldn't or doesn't occur when it should. And that's, and that's take, a problem there. Take cancer. Okay. We will come back to the example of cancer when we come okay. back from the break. We'll be back shortly. Okay. Thanks for still being with us on Tamuawani. Now, Bob, you were trying to explain to me about uh, cancer as an example. Please proceed. So when people think about cancer, mm -hmm. what people think about is cells dividing and dividing and dividing so okay. that they just grow without bound. Mm -hmm. And that cancerous growth is what's responsible for the disease. That picture is accurate, but, but incomplete. Mm -hmm. It turns out there are two ways we can end up with too many cells in our tissues. Okay. One is are. by too much cell division, mm -hmm. cells dividing and dividing, mm -hmm. and the other is by too little cell death. If cells that should die, die. Don't, don't, we'll have too many cells. Then it's like a bathtub. Yeah. Okay, take a bathtub. It's basically overpopulation. It's overpopulation. So take a bathtub, fill it halfway full, Okay, and turn the faucet on so water's coming in mm -hmm. and unplug the plug so that water's flowing out. Yeah. If the rate of water coming in and the rate of water coming out are the same, mm -hmm. the level of the water will be, will be the, same. Yes, the same. If we turn the faucet up, more water comes in, bathtub will overflow. Mm -hmm. That's cancer. And before you came along, this um, 
concept was not known and not understood by uh, the everybody by by the um, medical professions. Well, the the phenomenon to some extent was known, but I would say it was not appreciated. Okay. For example, when we started working on cell death, mm -hmm. I think most biologists, when they thought about cell death, mm -hmm. I mean, what does a biologist do? A biologist tries to study cells. cells. And yes. you take cells and you put them in a Petri plate and you study them, and if they die, you've done something wrong. Right? Mm -hmm. so, so cells that die were treated in the wrong way. They were mistreated. And that's the way that cell death in our bodies were, were considered. What we basically were responsible for discovering was that cell death is an inherent genetically controlled process and that we have genes. Mm -hmm. You and I have genes that make our cells die. Yep. And what we did was we identified these genes and figured out first order if, how, how, they, work, how okay. they work. Yeah. Okay. Now, the way we did this, okay, so we're talking about cancer and we're talking about Alzheimer's disease yeah. and actually more strikingly, there are various retinal disorders where mm -hmm. people become blind right. that are diseases of programmed cell death because programmed cell death is unleashed in our eye cells. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't study human beings. Human beings are complicated. Um, As they are, they are. We studied a microscopic worm. A little, it's called a nematode or a round worm. Mm -hmm. It's one millimeter long. If, if I were to show you some of these worms and you held them up to the light, they would look like pieces of lint. Right. They're very tiny, except they crawl. So uh -huh. you see moving pieces of lint. Uh -huh. And the animal that we studied, which is called C. elegans, Cenorhabditis elegans, yep. as you said, um, is very, very well suited for high level analytic mm -hmm biological studies. And so we were able to study this animal in detail and from our studies identify genes that are involved in programmed cell death mm -hmm. in this roundworm and study those genes and figure out how they interact and they form a genetic pathway. One gene controls another gene, which yeah. controls another gene, and, and it was so on. Uh, through the studies on the nematodes, on the um, C. elegans, that you actually applied that knowledge onto human beings. We made the discoveries in C. elegans. Mm -hmm. One of my students actually made uh, independently the first discovery that said that what we found in C. elegans mm -hmm. was the same as what goes on in a mammal, a mouse or a human, mm -hmm. and then the field expanded greatly. Yes, I'm sure it threw the doors wide many, open. Many, many, many people made, made pivotal contributions. Okay, but the question is now, Bob, um, what was the catalyst of you beginning the research on, on, on the C. elegans and, and, and degenerative um, diseases? Um, perhaps there was a void, a vacuum there that, that was there before that you decided there, to fill. What was there the catalyst? Was a, there was a huge void, mm -hmm. uh, but I'll be very clear about what the void was. It was a void in knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, it was not a void in disease knowledge that drove but. me, a void in basic knowledge. Okay. When we began our research, we had no idea if we were going to find anything relevant to human disease. There wasn't anything known. There mm -hmm. was no reason to be thinking that. We mm -hmm. didn't even know if we would find anything relevant to any animal other than this microscopic worm. What drove me was the desire to understand something fundamental about biology that no one else had ever understood. Right. We knew that cells died during development, mm -hmm. and I thought we could figure out how that so, came so about. I suppose we could look at it as a question that's been bugging you for quite some time, and, and you decided, hey, I'm going to open my books, and I'm going to start reading up about it, and I'm going to research on it. Well, the reading was very limited because oh, there wasn't course, much yeah. to read. <laughs> yeah, I, yes, but, I, I suppose, but that's, yeah. But that's probably the reason why you decided to embark on this journey. So I think part of what led me to this journey uh, was advice I got from my PhD advisor, mm -hmm. James Watson, who, who is known for the double helix, Watson Crick. Yeah. Uh -huh. So James Watson was, was one of my PhD advisors. And, and what Jim said was, when you do research, Research is difficult, mm -hmm. okay? 
and you'll make findings. And it's no harder to work on something important than to work on something unimportant. So you right. should pick something important and new to study. Mm -hmm. And if you do that and you do good science, you'll find something that will have broader impact. And I think that's a very important message. You pick something fundamental and not understood, mm -hmm. and if you understand it, um, you will find out a lot more than what you think you're studying because biology will prove to be broader than that. Okay. So I knew that this area of programmed cell death was something that had not been studied. Yep. I thought we had an opportunity to analyze mm -hmm. it, so we began our studies and we were able to identify first one gene, a killer gene. If you turn that gene off, all of the cells in this worm that should die didn't. Don't. Uh -huh. Then we identified a second killer gene, then we identified a protector gene, then we identified a third killer gene. And I'm sure from all those and findings, you know, more and more research is being done right now to, to find out more absolutely. about Absolutely, yep. absolutely. Okay, Bob, we have to go for another break right now. But when Very we come good. back, we're going to talk about Bob past, uh, I'm sorry, post uh, the, piece, uh, the Nobel Prize, and we'll see how it goes from there. Hi, we're back on um, Tamawani with uh, Professor um, Hovitz. Uh, now, Bob, um, it's been seven years since you bagged the big prize, if I may call it that. What's changed and what's new about you right now? Um, I would say the first thing that's different is that people take me seriously when they shouldn't. <laughs> okay, so, so the assumption is since I have a Nobel Prize, mm -hmm. I'm an expert in everything. And uh, I remember that the day after, actually it was two days after I received the Nobel Prize, mm -hmm. there was a big celebration for me at MIT. And the first thing I said was, remember, I don't know any more today than I knew two days ago. Yeah. I am the same person. Yes. On the other hand, the Nobel Prize uh, is not only a great honor, um, but it's also both a responsibility and an opportunity. Mm -hmm. So uh, I've been very involved, for example, in the United States in trying to help set scientific policy. And it is easier to speak with people in Washington mm -hmm. um, when you have the Nobel label yeah. because they say, okay, somebody takes you seriously, so maybe we should, we should listen. Too. Yeah. And uh, also more generally, uh, my, I think my influence and impact um, is greater. And with that, as I say, that's an opportunity, uh, but it's also a responsibility. So mm -hmm. if I say something that is really wrong, people may we'll take, take it, it too seriously. <laughs> and so I have, to be, I have to be very careful. But what about personally? What, um, what are the um, personal gains for yourself um, after winning the, um, the, the, the Nobel Prize, um, apart from meeting up with your old mates from uh, Rockwell Street? I believe. Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, and I believe that one of the uh, reasons why you embarked on this journey was because one of your aunts died of um, Alzheimer's. Um, so after, after you've won the, um, the prize, um, have you made any personal leaps and bounds or personal um, gains from, from, from winning the prize at all? I, I think one of the most wonderful parts of winning the prize is the opportunity to, to meet with uh, people I wouldn't have met otherwise. Being here today, mm -hmm. I, I am here because of the Nobel Prize. If okay. I had not received the Nobel Prize, I wouldn't be here. And uh, I am meeting already in, 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 this, in this adventure. Uh, mm -hmm. I've only been here now less than a day. No, I guess it's an entire day at this point. Mm -hmm. um, I've already met a number of people. I think it's very interesting. I've never been to Malaysia before. Mm -hmm. So the opportunity to, to meet new people and again to speak about issues more broadly is, is what I think is most important. Mm -hmm. um, on, on the personal level, uh, I, I still frankly find it amazing because to me when I grew up, a Nobel laureate, I mean, 
These were famous, yes. great people. These were and stuff now legends I think, are made of. And, but, but now what, what I think of is everybody I know knows a Nobel laureate. Mm -hmm. And that still is pretty amazing to me. And so again, what, what, I, what I try to, to do with that is, is to be helpful in mm -hmm. the ways that I can. Mm -hmm. um, I'm on many advisory commissions, um, local, further away, and uh, the opportunities, I get many, many invitations, mm -hmm. and it, it gives me the opportunity to choose those, which I think partially will be most fun, mm -hmm. but more fundamentally, where maybe I can make a difference. And speaking about opportunities, you are here, as I mentioned earlier, as a keynote speaker for the Bridges Dialogues mm -hmm. Towards a Culture of Peace program. Right. What exactly are you putting on the plate for the people here? Well, when, when I think about world peace, and I am not an expert in world peace. I'm an expert in a tiny little worm. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I didn't think that world peace and worms would be an appropriate we'll same label yes. for, <laughs> for my involvement. But when I, when I think about world peace, uh, what I think is really fundamental, one of the things that's really fundamental is the inequalities in the world. And there are many inequalities. We know there are great inequalities in wealth, mm -hmm. there are great inequalities in education, and there are great inequalities in health. Yeah. And to me, health is probably the driver of all of those. Because if you don't have health, mm -hmm. you can't do anything. You can't, you can't really focus on education. When I visited in, in West Africa, for example, and, and visited a, a, a school in West Africa, those kids have nothing, but they can't even begin to study because they don't have health. Um, wealth, you can't strive for wealth if you don't have health. So global health, to me, is a fundamental area of importance to world peace. Mm -hmm. And health is driven at the global level in two ways. One is institutionally. Mm -hmm by governments, international organizations, um, governmental or non-governmental, and foundations. That's the one hand. Okay. The second hand um, is science. If we don't have ways of preventing, uh, treating, and curing disease, um, we cannot make a difference mm -hmm. uh, that's sufficient to global health. And science is a field that's always developing itself, so how do you intend to, or do you have any plans to actually take a research further um, now that you've got the support of you know, the world community after you've gained your um, label as a Nobel winner? Well, my, my belief continues to be the same. What, what